Thanks for being here. I'm Stephen Romo in for Joe and Savannah today. And we begin this morning with the race for the White House and potentially a big problem for the Republican frontrunner, former President Donald Trump. Maine has now decided Trump is constitutionally ineligible to appear on the state's primary ballot next year. This follows last week's Colorado decision to also exclude Trump from the ballot, citing the 14th Amendment's ban on those who engaged in insurrection from holding office. The decision was made by Maine's Secretary of State, Democrat Sheena Bellows. In her decision, Bellows wrote that Trump is not eligible due to his actions regarding the January 6th attack on the Capitol. A Trump campaign spokesperson says they will appeal the main decision as well. Meanwhile, in California, Trump will remain on that state's March primary ballot. California's Secretary of State had faced political pressure to reject Trump's candidacy, but declined to find him ineligible there. For the latest, let's bring in NBC News campaign embed Jake Trailer and NBC News now legal analyst Angela Sanadella. Good morning to you both. And Jake, let's start with you. So Trump had called on the main secretary of state, who is a Democrat, to recuse herself, saying she's just too partisan. Uh, we should point out Trump will remain on that ballot while the appeals and all that process plays out. But explain, if you would, that decision for us and how we got here. Stephen, if you were trying to keep up from home yesterday, you might have been asking, wait, will Trump be on the ballot in all 50 states in 2024 or not? And the short answer is uh, we don't actually fully know yet. Yesterday, right around the time we learned Trump would temporarily remain on the ballot in Colorado in a push from their state GOP, uh, Maine's top election official, the secretary of state, ruled that Trump was ineligible for the 2024 primary ballot. Now, this is another example of how states have individualized sets of laws, and uh, they handle this 14th Amendment challenge differently. Maine is the first state where a single official was able to rule that Trump was ineligible, though, as you mentioned, the Secretary of State did say her decision is stayed or paused uh, until the court can take up the case. So where are we right now? We're waiting for a Trump appeal and then uh, anticipating the Supreme Court to take up these cases in Colorado and Maine, which uh, is very likely considering the importance and time sensitivity of these cases. Have we heard anything, Jake, from the Trump campaign since that Maine decision? Yeah, the Trump campaign almost immediately responded to the Maine decision yesterday. Uh, campaign spokesperson Stephen Chong told me they will absolutely appeal this decision. Uh, the campaign also issued really harsh criticism of, of Maine Secretary of State, calling this a a uh, hyper-partisan act and, and calling it election interference. And so we saw many GOP Trump loyalists that were quick to, to uh, jump to Trump's defense on true social last night. We also know that each time Trump is indicted or, or faces criminality, uh, he sees a bump in polling. So experts on, on both sides here say there's high possibility that this case might fall through, but ultimately still somehow energizes Trump's base heading into a primary and a general election. Some pretty interesting dynamics with that bump in polling. Angela, let's bring you in here. Right now, uh, several courts, they've already sided with Trump in the recent decisions in uh, Michigan, Arizona, Minnesota as well, allowing Trump to stay on the ballots in those states. So what do you make of the main decision? Well, look, I think at this point, every state is doing what they're supposed to do. So the job of the Secretary of State in Maine is to literally disqualify people that she thinks should be barred from the ballot. So from that perspective, if you're running for president and you're under 35, she would disqualify you from the ballot without direction from the Supreme Court, without clarity on what this clause really means. She is just doing her job, Stephen. Well, Angela, if you would explain to us where the Supreme Court comes into all of this, does it come down to how they interpret Section 3 of the 14th Amendment? Or is the Supreme Court going to have to do some fact-finding here to determine whether or not Trump did participate in the insurrection, even though he wasn't charged with that? So the way the Supreme Court works, I would think it, it's extremely unlikely they will actually fact find and decide that Trump is either qualified or disqualified to run for the presidency. But what they should, and we hope they would do, is outline a more specific process with details of how to determine if a presidential candidate has been disqualified. So that means whether or not being convicted by a jury of his or her peers, or whether or not that requires Congress jumping in to define this. Because at this point, what these states are interpreting is the U.S. Constitution, not their own. And because the actions of one state will affect the other, and because it triangulates with really the inalienable right of voters in this country, it's like taking a fire hose to the Supreme Court store. They are going to answer, Stephen.
Yeah, many people waiting for that and expecting that. So, Jake, the main primary is on Super Tuesday coming up in March, but the ballots, they have to be printed earlier all the way in January. They have to be sent overseas for military service members. So time is really ticking on that decision. Where does this go from here? Right. Well, according to Maine state law, the uh, Superior Court here must make a decision within 20 days from yesterday. So that'd be about January 17th. So we'll very likely see a weigh in on Trump's eligibility within a few weeks before ballots are actually sent out to voters. But again, because of the consequentiality of these cases, I mean, we're talking about a question regarding a former president running for reelection for the highest office in the land. We are very likely to at some point soon see the Supreme Court weigh in here. I appreciate we did not have to use the word unprecedented, though I think it would fit in several circumstances here. Jake and Angela, thanks so much. Meanwhile, on the presidential campaign trail, Republican candidate Nikki Haley spending a lot of time on the defensive for what she left out when asked about the cause of the Civil War. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has that story. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley in cleanup mode after leaving out slavery as a root cause of the Civil War during a town hall in New Hampshire on Wednesday. What do you want me to say about slavery? No, um, uh, you've answered my question. Thank you. Next question. Haley spent Thursday attempting to explain what she meant. Of course the Civil War was about slavery. And make clear the role slavery played in American history. We know the Civil War was about slavery. But it was also more than that. It was about the freedoms of every individual. Her opponents seized on the comments. President Joe Biden responding, quote, it was about slavery. And GOP rival Ron DeSantis arguing she isn't ready for the big stage. The minute that she faces any type of scrutiny, uh, she tends to cave. As governor of South Carolina, Haley pushed for the removal of a Confederate flag on display on the Capitol grounds after a mass shooting at a black church in Charleston, carried out by a white supremacist. It's time to move the flag from the Capitol grounds. She made that decision after intense pressure by African-American leaders in the wake of the massacre. The firestorm comes as Haley is gaining ground on the clear frontrunner, former President Donald Trump. Trump has routinely used divisive rhetoric and recently made racist comments about migrants and minority groups. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. But Trump's controversial words have done little to change the trajectory of the race. And these comments come at a make or break moment for the Haley campaign, with polls showing Donald Trump leading by more than double digits and just 18 days to go before Iowa and less than 30 days before New Hampshire. Wow, 18 days to go. Ryan Nobles, thanks so much for that. For more on this, let's bring in Julia Manchester. She's a national political reporter for the Hill newspaper and digital media platform. Julia, good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. So this all comes as Haley is in a fight for second in the Republican primary race, along with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, of course. She got some key endorsements and funding. So what do you make of the timing for all this? Seems like it's not a great time for her. Could, could this harm her momentum and ultimately change the outcome of the primaries? Yeah, good morning. Look, it's not a good time for something like this to happen, especially as Haley was getting favorable coverage and really building that momentum going into Iowa and especially New Hampshire. You know, Trump is the clear front runner in Iowa. He appears on track to win that state. But in New Hampshire, we've been looking at that state. Our polling average shows Haley only behind Trump by 17 points in that state. So we saw her gaining momentum, but this is a very negative story for Nikki Haley. And it's especially negative because we know that Nikki Haley was someone who sort of signified potentially the future for the Republican, Republican Party. She's a woman. She's a person of color. She's suburban. She's educated. She was seen as that new face of the party, which has been predominantly white and male in terms of its leadership. And it comes at a time when the Republican Party is really trying to appeal to voters of color. And, you know, polling shows that there could be some opportunities Opportunity there, So this doesn't necessarily play well uh, for that narrative. Now, in terms of the long term consequences, look, we're in a time when there's obviously a very fast moving news cycle. Yesterday, the story dominated the headlines. But last night we were talking about Trump being kicked off of the main ballot. So we don't know how much the story will continue to bog Haley down. But it's certainly not good two weeks from Iowa.
Yeah, a bit of an unforced error for certain. She did come back, though, and try to backtrack fairly quickly about those comments. What did you make of her effort to try to clean that up? Look, I think the damage was already done. And, you know, her effort to say this was a quote unquote Democrat plant or a Democrat operative, um, that doesn't necessarily bode well as either. I mean, you saw the DeSantis campaign very much seize on that, you know, asking, you know, well, can she answer these questions even if this was coming from a journalist? for example. So, you know, I don't think it was necessarily, it came across as the best way to clean it up, but she had to, and she said what needed to be said, I think, in the first place, that slavery was absolutely a root cause of the Civil War. But the problem is she's going to be on cleanup duty at least for a couple more days or at least for today. And I think she'd rather be talking about her candidacy. Yeah, for certain. Uh, and talking about the South Carolina primary coming up on March 24th, she, of course, was the former governor there. She's popular there. Trump does hold a lead in polling, but of course, her campaign was uh, hoping to outperform him. Uh, almost two months to go to that. How will the, all this play there? Will, this, will she make it to the primary? And how will this end up playing for it all? Well, we have to see how she does in Iowa and New Hampshire first, because I think that will impact, you know, whether she gets to South Carolina or how she performs in South Carolina. Look, Iowa is going to be a big test for her and Ron DeSantis. I would say more so for Ron DeSantis because he's put literally all of his eggs in the Iowa basket. But for Haley, she's had a much more broad campaign focusing on Iowa and New Hampshire and then obviously her home state of South Carolina. I think there is opportunity for her in New Hampshire in particular. Like I said, our polling average shows her 17 points behind Donald Trump. Chris Christie polling at roughly 10% in New Hampshire. So if he were to drop out, and he's given no indication that he will, but hypothetically, if he were to drop out, that would put Haley much uh, more close to Donald Trump, assuming that a lot of Christie's never Trump constituents or never Trump uh, supporters would go with Haley. But that's not even certain at this point. Hmm. Time is taking down a lot of stuff. It's going to happen very soon. Julia Manchester, thanks so much. All right, turning now to the war in the Middle East. Israel now acknowledging that civilians were hit during a strike on a Gaza refugee camp this week. And an American citizen who was believed to be a hostage in Gaza has now been declared dead. Julie Weinstein was reportedly killed in a Hamas attack, the Hamas attack that started all of this back on October 7th. Here's NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman with more on that. In a rare move, Israel's military admitting serious mistakes. Acknowledging a Christmas Eve strike on a central Gaza refugee camp unnecessarily killed civilians. Israel saying its fighter jets were targeting Hamas sites, but also struck nearby buildings. Adding, the IDF regrets the harm to uninvolved individuals. The IDF also concluding an investigation into how Israeli troops mistakenly killed three hostages this month saying their deaths could have been prevented. A spokesman saying, we are responsible for what happened. Meanwhile, another American family is grieving. 70-year-old Judy Weinstein, a U.S. citizen, was believed to be held hostage in Gaza. But her kibbutz announced she was actually killed in the October 7th terror attacks and her body brought to Gaza. Her 73-year-old husband suffered the same fate. There are now six Americans presumed captive in Gaza, including IDF soldier Adon Alexander from New Jersey. He's my boy, and every day, every minute of the day, I'm, I'm just, I'm terrified. And a former hostage is speaking out. 20-year-old Mia Shechem was held for 54 days. Now free, Shechem compared her experience to the Holocaust, saying she was held not in a tunnel, but in a family house with women and children. She recalls the hospital where she says a surgeon operated on her hand without anesthesia, telling her, you're not coming home alive. And for the hostages that remain in Gaza, few signs of hope for new negotiations. Josh Letterman, NBC News, Tel Aviv. Here with more is NBC News White House correspondent Aaron Gilchrist, who's currently traveling with the president in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Aaron, so how has President Biden reacted to the death of Judy Weinstein? 
Uh, Stephen, the president uh, obviously, obviously has been keeping up with what's been going on uh, in Israel and other parts of the world for that matter. He has a na his national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, here in St. Croix with him. And so when word of the confirmation of Judy Weinstein's death was able to make its way to the president, uh, he put out a statement, and we'll put part of it up on the screen for you. And the president said that, uh, called this, this loss uh, a, a tragic development in what's been happening in Israel. And part of the statement reading, we're holding Judy Judith and Gad, her husband, who was also uh, determined to have died in the October 7th attack. Uh, for their, their four children, seven grandchildren, and other loved ones close to our hearts. I will never forget their daughter, what their daughter and the family members of other Americans held hostage in Gaza have shared with me. We know the president has met uh, both virtually and in person with families uh, of Americans who were being held by Hamas and other groups inside Gaza. Uh, the president, really, I think, through the White House has been almost telegraphing, trying to prepare us for the possibility that something like this could come to be the reality. We were receiving numbers of Americans who were being held hostage or unaccounted for, as the White House termed it. Uh, and at different points over the last two, almost three months, we've heard officials from the White House say they don't know the conditions of the hostages. They didn't know the conditions of the Americans. And uh, sort of telegraphing, I think, that this was a possibility, that they could have been uh, taken after they had died uh, at the hands of Hamas. The president adding at the end of his statement, we will not stop working to bring them home. We know there are six other Americans who are still unaccounted for at this point, Stephen. Heartbreaking and terrifying for those families, Aaron. And staying with Israel here, two Israeli officials telling NBC News that Secretary of State Antony Blinken will make yet another trip to Israel in the new year. What can we expect from that meeting? Yeah, the State Department hasn't given any details about a potential agenda for the Secretary of State uh, in travels to the Middle East, but we do expect this trip to happen early in the new year, and it, it's continuing a, a regular cadence of engagements for the Secretary of State on what's been happening in Israel and the larger Middle East region, if you will. Every time that he's been there or engaged in phone calls, he's uh, done a couple of things. One, obviously, talked to Israel about the operations that it's executing on the ground in Gaza, talked about uh, st starting to scale some of those operations back or at least targeting them more uh, more more specifically on Hamas leaders in an in a intel driven way that is more precise that's what we've heard from the administration at the same time he's also obviously been talking about hostages and how to restart negotiations between Israel and Hamas through an intermediary to try to get more hostages released uh, and then there's a, a big conversation that's been happening particularly as of late around what happens after Israel has completed its, op its operations in Gaza trying to make sure that there is uh, a way to start up a new Palestinian uh, government in those parts of uh, the, the area that are that are home to Palestinians now. Many families waiting for any news 84 days now after that January or that October 7th attack. Aaron Gilchrist, thanks so much. Well, the countdown is on, of course, to New Year's Eve. And for some passengers traveling home or traveling to celebrate, it's already off to a bumpy start. Today and New Year's Day expected to be two of the busiest days of the year for air travel. The TSA is expecting to screen at least two and a half million people per day. But the weather is threatening to cause problems for those travel plans with a washout for parts of the West Coast, along with some dangerous riptides and flooding. Here in the Northeast, storms dumped heavy rain and caused flooding in some cities. And people in the plains are still digging out after a dangerous ice storm hit that region. Another day of dealing with the storm that's causing quite the mess. Let's take a look at your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us now with more. Hey, Michelle. Hey, Stephen, great to see you. Yeah, we are kind of stuck in this pattern where we can't move the storms out. So in the Northeast, we're looking a lot like yesterday, where we're looking at that precipitation in parts of the Northeast. In New England, really, we're seeing some mixed precipitation there. On the back side of this system, you can see some blue falling in the Midwest. That is snow. It's light snow, but still could see one, two, three inches of snow. That's along the Appalachians as well. And even some snow reaching as far north as us, uh, far south as the Southeast, Northern Alabama, Northern Georgia. Again, it's really warm there, so it's not going to stick, but still seeing some snow showers there. On the West Coast, we're looking at really large waves, once again, up to 25 feet in some spots, so really dangerous along the coast there. And then a powerful storm system is making its way on shore. You can see the green kind of creeping into the map. That is the rain falling, and we could see heavy rain up to four inches in some spots, especially in northern and central California, and also some really heavy snow along the Sierra and Nevada mountains. We have dense fog advisories this morning. We're looking at low visibilities across the northeast into the Midwest, down to three miles. In Chicago, at Chicago, Chicago O'Hare, that's going to slow you down, down to a mile in portions of New York as well. LaGuardia looking at 1.3. 
and we're looking at down to half mile in Burlington, Vermont. So you get the idea. We're looking at low clouds. We're looking at fog. It's gray once again, kind of stuck in the pattern that we saw yesterday and the day before. So possible travel impacts today. We're looking at Boston, Chicago, New York City, also St. Louis. Looking good, though, in Atlanta, looking much better in Miami. We had a tough day there yesterday. On the West Coast, Seattle could see some possible delays, likely delays in San Francisco because we're going to be looking at really gusty winds and also heavy rain falling all throughout this Friday. Then as we near uh, tomorrow, we're looking much better in the Northeast. We're finally going to clear that system out. So looking good in Boston, New York City, D.C., all the major hubs along the East Coast, Chicago, expected to be good weather-wise as well. Then we're looking at possible impacts for San Francisco, Los Angeles, and uh, portions of Southern California because we're going to see some lingering showers throughout the day. This is what it looks like, slow improvement in the Northeast. We're going to be stuck with those showers today, Stephen, but looking much, much better by tomorrow. Back to you. All right. Like the sound of that. Michelle Grossman, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.